I think this is probably our last installment of uh, the Rooted and Grounded in Love, and then we'll see where we go from there. We've been talking about love. Pastor Richard started us off in that theme. And we're going to, I, I don't think we're necessarily wrapping it up today, but we're going to put a bookmark in it for a little while. And we'll come back to it as the Lord releases. But um, something that I want to share along those lines, we're talking about being rooted and grounded in love, planted in, developing a system of roots that will reach into the soil of the word, of the anointing, of the love of God, and draw nourishment from it. A system whereby we draw nourishment from the word of God and then becoming stable there because the deeper you put your roots down, the less easily you are moved. I'm going to say that again. The deeper you put your roots into the word of God, the love of God, the anointing of God, the less easily you are moved to the extent that you become, I shall not be moved. Some of you may remember that old hymn. But uh, like a tree that's planted by the waters, I will not be moved by circumstances. By whatever's happening above ground, it is not the definitive. And I draw my nourishment from the root system. And that system can be listening to the Word of God, reading the Word of God, having your devotional time with God, prayer, that's your system. That's how you put those roots down as you choose to draw. You choose to draw. And as you choose to draw and learn to draw, you will find that it will be a continual process like we don't have to think to breathe. It happens automatically while we're doing other things. We get our roots that deeply, our system that deep in him, then we just begin to draw constantly. It's a 24-7 God consciousness. It's not, oh, I need a few minutes. Let me go pray. God, where are you? Or you're constantly drawing. There, there will still be those moments where you may feel that way. But constantly drawing on him. And the important thing to remember about that is uh, that God loves you. It sounds so simple. It may sound cliche to you. I hope that it does not. I hope that it has become reality. God loves you. He sees you. Well, how can he do that? Millions of people on the face of the earth. What does he care about me? Oh, my goodness. You do not understand the love of God. Each and every one that is born into this earth does not escape his attention, his love, his direction, his care, and his purpose. But too often we run away from it. But every second of the day is an opportunity to run back to that love that purpose. He's God. He is not limited as we are in time and geography. He sees you. What did David say? My, my down-sitting and my uprising. He sees it all. He sees my coming and my going. And he has a word for me every day. I am a firm believer that God is always talking to us and over us. But it's like a radio frequency. You have to tune in to hear it. He's constantly speaking. His word is speaking over you, about you, for your success, your direction. Are we listening? And when we listen, is it with ears that know this person, this God, this entity that created me, loves me infinitely, anything he tells me is for my good? Or I, are we like small children and we're still screaming when he's slapping our hand away from the hot stove. Have you figured out yet that what God tells you is for your good? But I want that. But if God says it's not the right season, then understand that it could be your downfall. Because God loves you. He is good. I've had people tell me when we do the, the temperament profile, um, it's the, one of the more simple ones, but it talks about the phlegmatic, sanguine. Are y'all familiar with that? Mostly melancholies. I've had women of God ask me, can I ask God to change my temperament? Because I don't like me. And it kind of broke my heart. 
because I had to know in that moment that she did not understand the infinite perfection of God, the amazing design and strategy of God that he would give you this beautiful opportunity to be this fabulous person and all you see are your flaws and your problems. You just need a little more understanding. Melancholy, INFJ, whatever you want to call it, you don't understand how perfectly you were formed. You don't understand what a masterpiece you are. God designed you with the answers that people around you need. It just comes so easily to you. You do it so well, effortlessly, and people next to you are saying, how does he do that? Because they're different. And God made us all to be a blessing, and the anointing within us is to fix things, problem-solving, bringing order out of chaos. What is your part? It's fabulous, and you're going to love it when you understand God's love. He's not going to give you anything that's less than. He doesn't have the A team and then the B team and then the third tier that, well, you know, what was that movie? There was a kid's movie, Sky High or something. And they were like the superheroes, and then there were the ones with the lesser powers that they couldn't fly, but maybe they could glow. You know, there, there's no lesser. There's no lesser in Christ. So I want to encourage you in God's love today, and I want you to take every filter off that would say, yeah, I've heard that. Yeah, I know that. Yeah, I know. I know. Because if you're saying it that way, you don't really know. But if you're saying, oh, my goodness, yes. Oh, yes. Hallelujah. Then you're letting it hit you with the reality of the anointing, of the empowerment, of the love of God. John 3.16 is a great place to start. For God so loved that he gave, knowing that we were going to mess it up, knowing that he was going to have to send a part of the Trinity to endure suffering, separated from his son, and he did it anyway. He gave anyway. So great was his love for us because he knew that they're going to mess it up, but I've got a fix and once they mess it up and then we send the fix, it can't be messed up anymore. Do you get that? It cannot be messed up anymore. Adam and Eve messed up. They got sent out of the garden, lost the glow, lost the anointing, lost the presence of God. And it was hard, I'm sure. But because of what Jesus did, God began right then prophesying, the fix is in, the fix is coming, the fix is coming. And when he did, and when it did, and when that happened, and he returned to the Father, it can't be messed up anymore. You can't mess up big enough to short circuit what God wants to do. Do you understand that? You can fail every single test up to now. But the next opportunity, that's the one. What do they call it? Pitch to you win. Dad's in charge. And I have, you know, struck out 945 times, but 946 could be the home run. Let's go. Let's keep going. Because it can't be messed up anymore. We will spend eternity with God. And we will be successful here when... We understand his love and tune in. God so loved that he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Everlasting doesn't mean like after you die and you go to heaven. Now everlasting life begins. It starts right now when you say, yes, Lord, everlasting life is now. We don't have to wait for heaven. Jesus said, I came here to give life, and that more abundantly, because of the love of God. John 15, this just amazes me every time I read it. Jesus says, Jesus says, as the Father loved me, I also have loved you. 
This is not like second tier love, like, well, there's the love and the Godhead, and then he kind of loves us. As the Father loved Jesus, what did he do? Right in front of everybody, he sent everything he had. He said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And that's his word to you. Jesus loves us just as the Father loved him. That's pretty amazing. That's verse 9, John 15, 9, and then verse 10, and he said, abide in my love. Well, why would we ever want to leave? Abide in my love. He said, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. If you live in the way that I've shown you, then you're not going to get outside of my love. You don't have to worry about that. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Now, what did Jesus do? He did what he saw the Father do. He said what he heard the Father say. I'm going to say that's our example of abiding in that love. Abiding in the love is watching him imitating our Father as dear children, right? Verse 12, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. I need to love Rosie just as God loved Jesus. That sounds like a tall order. We'll talk more about that in a minute. And greater love has no win than this, than to lay down his life for his friends. I don't believe we're being asked to be crucified for our friends, that's been done. One time, one death, by one, sin was put to death. He was raised again. But there are some things that we do that feel like laying down our life. Like I was going to go shopping today and go to the mall, but somebody needs a trip to see their loved one or Somebody needs some help cleaning their house, or somebody needs some help cleaning out the front yard. Somebody needs some help understanding what God has called them to do. They're really upset today. Somebody needs us. Somebody somewhere needs what you have. God has need of you. I heard somebody say the other day, and I really had to sit and contemplate it. He said, do you have time for revival? Would it fit in your schedule if it were to hit? Do you have time? We need to make time. We need to make time for that. Romans 5, verse 8, God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You know, there are a lot of churches that they won't let you come in unless you get cleaned up to a certain point. You have to stay in the back, sit on the back row. You know, the ushers are like, oh, you don't smell right. You can't. You can't come in here. You don't look right. While we were a mess, Jesus didn't say, get it together, come back, we'll talk. He died for us while we were yet sinners. How much more should we love one another? Romans 8, 35 through 39. You're probably very familiar with this scripture, but sometimes we feel differently than what the word says. And we choose what we feel to dictate. You'll understand. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation. Man, this has been hard. I guess God doesn't really love me anymore. I've heard people say that. Nobody in this room, of course. But I've heard people say, I I thought God loved me. No. Tribulation does not separate you from the love of God. It's... Jesus said, in the world, you're going to have tribulation, but be of good cheer. Don't give up. As Pastor Brian was sharing, you've prayed about it. Expect it. It's been a week. It's been three weeks. It's been a month. It's been a year. It's been a couple years. How long is too long to wait? Trust God. And when we get our eyes off of the ooh and the ow and I don't like that and that hurts and begin to see, okay, God, what are you doing? When we cooperate with the process, quite often we'll find that it will end sooner because God is trying to do a work in us so he can do a work through us. 
shall distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or sword, anything that we go through, anything that comes against us, cannot separate us from his love. But what is his love a guarantee of? Our victory. Whatever is born of God, what? Overcomes the world. Verse 37, yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. More than conquerors. For I am persuaded, verse 38, that neither death or life or angels, principalities, powers, things present or things to come, neither height nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God. Things that have come against you or things that you have done. Even when we run away, he is still with us. I think it's David that said, if I make my bed in hell, he's with me. We can choose not to go there. But if we get messed up and we do, God is there to rescue us. Galatians 2, chapter 2 and verse 20. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. Some translations say the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You know, we see that in a lot of sci-fi type movies that, you know, well, I'm one person here, but if you kill me uh, with your lightsaber or whatever it is, I will be able to be in many places at once. They got that from God. That's not original. Jesus said, when I go, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. He's going to be in you. That's why I gave myself for you and made you worthy made you worthy but my blood to once again be the dwelling place of the most high God you are mobile tabernacles carrying the presence of God because Jesus loved me this I know and he died gave himself for me so that I could once again inhabit the presence and have that one-on-one -on -one communion with him. Ephesians 2, verses 4 and 5. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, dead in sin, he made us alive together with Christ. With the anointed one and his anointing, we live because life does not mean to exist. Y'all know my little pet peeve about that. Something awful happens. Well, that's life. No, it's not. That's existence in the world system. Life is the abundance of God, his love, his joy. What he came to give us, that's life. Life and that more abundantly. So he made us alive together with Christ for by grace we've been saved Ephesians 5 25 husbands love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her now there's a whole message there about husbands and wives but I just want to focus on the part that says like Christ loved the church and gave himself for her the church, the ecclesia, his called out ones, that's us. You see, God loved me. Jesus died for me. Jesus died for Sister Holly. But he also loves us being a part of the local expression of his body. All of us together. He loves family reunion day when we all come together, gathered together unto him. He loves that. I see that. I don't know about you, but I picture that when we're coming into worship time and whatever we're doing, whether we're watching videos or we're just singing and lifting up our voices, God's like, here comes the family. How many of you know that feeling? Your kids are grown. They've, they've moved out. They're gone. And 
hey, mom, I'm going to come into town. I'm going to come see you for a while. Oh, my goodness. All right. Let's put the feast on. What do we have in this time? Tamales? What are we going to do? It's time to feast. The family's coming. I see that when we come into praise and worship. God's like, here they come. Here they come. They came to hang out with me. That's our father. That's how much he loved us. Hebrews 12, 6. A lot of people don't like this one. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens. I want you to understand that, that having discipline, having boundaries is a sign of love. Parents, those who are afraid to use the rod, whatever it is that you use for discipline, you're afraid to bring correction. You're afraid, well, I just want to be their friend. I just want to love them. I'm just going to love them. Well, whom the Lord loves, he chastens. He's going to tell you, that's not what I showed you. And we're going to do that again and get it right this time. And you're going to have another opportunity because until you master that, you don't get to move on. You know, self-mastery. We did homeschooling, PACES. They had a little workbook. They do the little workbook and they take a little test. If they don't pass the test, you do the workbook again. Because I love you enough not to send you into next year's biology not understanding this. Okay? God loves you enough to not send you out there with chinks and holes in your armor where it could take you down. So whom the Lord loves, he puts in order. He chastens. He disciplines. He directs. He teaches. He helps. Let me show you a better way. Let me show you a better way. What is that more excellent way? Love. 1 John 3 Starting in verse 1, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. You know, there was a space in that time that God could have said, Well, we finally got rid of those ornery folks. I don't have to mess with them anymore because they were cut off. They were cut off, but God chose in his love to adopt us. He chose to make us accepted in the beloved. He chose to make us his children. He wants us. You are wanted. You are not tolerated. You are wanted. And I pray for the day that the body of Christ rises up and realizes that the people sitting to their left and right should be wanted, valued, appreciated, honored, Received in love. I don't care how ornery they are. Some people are like trying to love a porcupine. I understand. But it doesn't withdraw what we should do. What manner of love that he has bestowed upon us. And then again, 1 John 3 and verse 16. By this we know that we love because he laid down his life for us. And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. There is that admonition again. Putting our family in high priority. What can I do for you? How can I serve you? How can I love you? 1 John 4 and verse 10. In this is love. We're close close to the end here. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us. And he sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. The propitiation, the one who removes the obstacles for reconciliation. Jesus went in and took care of that for us so that we could be reconciled. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us. I think of it as uh, like the sun and the moon. Because the moon doesn't really have any light of itself. But it receives the light from the sun and reflects it. And you would look at the moon and, at night and say, oh no, it, it's lit. It's shining. It's shining. But it's what it has received from the Son. You see, in ourselves, I need you to understand this principle because this is where we're wrapping up. In ourselves, inherently in our physical nature, we are not really capable of love. We are not capable of love. I'm just going to put it out there. There's sentiment, there's commitment, but it is not love because God is love. And without God, there is no love. So we have to understand that we must receive from him 
and reflect that love. It, it's not, we, we don't just come to him and love him, except that we've received his love. That's why it's so important that I keep saying you need to know you're loved. You are loved because you can't love somebody else if you don't receive God's love. Because that's what you love with, the love you receive. How often do you just sit and bask in the love of God? Well, I want to get some, let's do some word study. Let's get some Greek and Hebrew. Let's figure out what he's talking about here. How about we just sit and bask in his love? Thank you for your love, God, because that's what fills you up. Don't neglect the study of the word. It's all important, but sometimes we are actually... We would say we're not, but we're really trying to perform for God. Do the right thing. Did I read my word today? Do the right thing. Do the right thing. That's the wrong motivation. God loves me. He's got something good to tell me today. I am so excited to see what he has to say. Getting, getting things right. Getting that understanding correct. Because that's what it's going to take. We're going to have to have the confidence of his love to love those that he sends us. I'm going to say that this group of people right here is the cream of the crop. Y'all are easy to love. I'm not lying. Y'all are easy to love. Y'all are amazing. You love God. You understand where he's put you. Y'all are, y'all are amazing. I love I could stand and talk with every one of you for probably 45 minutes out there in the parking lot. Y'all know how we try to get home, but, oh, but I want to talk to this person. Oh, but I, I need to talk to Sister Gwen because she gives the best hugs and this and that. And, and we love each other, but there's some people coming. Some folks are coming. And we're going to have to understand that we are loved, and that is the love with which we love others. Because Jesus said, Mark 12, starting in verse 30, you will love the Lord your God. These are the commandments. Love the Lord your God with your whole heart, your soul, your mind, every faculty of thought. This is the Amplified Classic. I'm trying to weed out a few adjectives. Every faculty of thought, moral understanding, and all your strength. This is the first and principal commandment. Love God. Well, we have to receive his love in order to reflect it back to him. And the second is like it and is this. And to me, it's the second commandment, but it's got an A and a B part. You will love your neighbor as yourself. Oh, so I can't really love Serena if I don't love myself. Some of you need to forgive yourself for mistakes. Forgive yourself for, oh, I missed that opportunity. I should have done that. It's over for me. God told me to do that, and I didn't, and I guess that's it. You need to forgive yourself because God already has. You say, God, remember when? He's like, I don't know what you're talking about. He has chosen to forget. Forgive and forget. That's what we have to do with ourselves so that we can love our neighbor, the ones that God sends us. I have to love myself. And I can't love myself unless I understand how much God loves me and receive his love. We are his masterpiece. The masterpiece doesn't look at the sculptor and say, oh, you did an awful job. Think about it. Think about that. When you go to God and say, oh, I'm just so messed up, God. I don't know how you can use me. And God's like, I made you. What are you saying? You saying I didn't do a good job? I'm not going to accuse God of that. I may remind him he's got some work to do, getting me back to what he originally wanted me to be. But he's working on that. So we have to receive that love. We understand in giving that God asks us to give out of our increase. He doesn't say, when you got nothing, you need to dig up something somewhere and give it because you're going to give something to me before I'm going to do anything for you. No, he said, out of the first fruits of your increase, you give. So out of the increase of love that he gives us, we love in the same way. Where is the equipping? The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. I'm wrapping up. He has shed his love in our hearts 
But just like we've all been given the measure of faith, it needs to grow. It needs to uh, enlarge within us. And how do we do that? There are a lot of ways, but I'm just going to submit to you Galatians 5, 22. Read it in several translations. Read it on your own. I'm not going to take time to read them all here, but it is the fruit that derives from his presence within you. It's the fruit that comes from spending time in his presence. What's the first one? The fruit of the Spirit is love. Spending time in his presence, with him, in him, in love, in his love, increases our love so that when we go out there to the unlovely that we may deem them, suddenly the compassion of Christ comes upon us. The compassion of God, the anointing of God, a divine ability beyond your ability. And you can't wait to pray for those people and let them know God loves them. That's what we've got to get into. Coming back to our first love, receiving his love, and then we're able to minister it out. Amen. I just got a a few things to say here, and then we're going to do something different. Uh, We've been sharing about this for maybe three years now on how God is preparing this house, and I'm talking about house of the Lord, to minister to, to raise up, to grow up, to love and cover the next generation. Not that, this, that the present generation is bad or it's broke or anything, but God has called us to start the next generation. And we, we have had classes We've had weekend seminars. We've had messages from the pulpit trying to explain the importance of teaching and training those who are right now accepting Jesus into their lives and finding out that they know very little about what they've experienced. How many of you heard of the Ash, 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 Ashbury Uh and at the college in there in Kentucky. How many have heard about the one at A&M? Yeah, Texas A&M is having revival. And there's, there's little pockets all over the United States. It's these people. It's these people that we need to be ready to parent or to grow up. Uh, we've talked about being a family to those. Even if they already have biological fathers and mothers, we have spent time learning how to clean up the dark things of our past that may be skewing our point of view or our actions of how we should be looking at God to show us how a family is really supposed to operate. But seeing the revival spring up in college campuses around the country gives us more insight into what God is doing. That is our mission. That is our vision out there in in these colleges that are experiencing revival, or they're experiencing the love of God. And now they need to be trained in that. That's the mission and the cry of our heart, to change nations by changing generations. This is basically what our Africa trip is about. We're going to be teaching and training and showing the leaders of Life Center there in Botswana some ways and ideas to turn the hearts of the next generation to God so that God, through them, can turn the whole nation back to the Father. Did you know that God, that Jesus said to make disciples of the nation? He didn't say make disciples of the people of the nation. He wants the whole nation. He wants everything about it. He wants the government. He wants uh, all the social stuff. He wants it all back. He doesn't just want the people, although that's where it starts. If you can start with 
with a, uh, the learning and teaching of how they are to lead and how they are to teach and train, then when you have the majority of the people that are the family of God, then the government can be uh, changed. The, the military can be changed. The whole concept around that country can be changed into or, or given back to the Father. Now we want to, we've got a little short video that we want to share with you and I think it encapsul encapsulates all of these things. Uh, this was, uh, it was uh, Pastor Tim Sheets from Oasis Church in Ohio. Uh, he was ministering at a conference just a couple of weeks ago, I think in February. And uh, this is him sharing a message he received from God. So you can go ahead and show that real quick. It's a short video, only about eight minutes. Last week as I was praying for the coming generation, my heart breaks for them. I was praying for a change in the mess. Our government and education system has caused our children to have to live in. Praying to reverse the mess nominal woke religion and churches have caused praying to reverse the effects of fatherlessness and passive parenting that gave the children no moral compass didn't raise them in the fear of the admonition of the Lord praying to reverse the effects on innocent children from drag queens, homosexual perversion, gender confusion, doctrines of devils, and the antichrist agendas of Baal. I heard these words. They were spoken so emphatically and yet with such compassion and such love that it it caused my spirit to begin to shake. It, my spirit started to vibrate. And I began to weep uncontrollably. And that's not me. I, I'm not that way. And I haven't even heard what he said yet. <laughs> but I began to weep. I knew something else was emerging from worms wrapped in cocoons of faith decrees. I knew a new era of Father's greatness was somehow going to emerge. Transformation, change will come. Reformation somehow. And I heard these words. I wrote as fast as I could, not wanting to miss any. And every word had tears splashing on the paper. Never really had it like that. I wrote these words. Behold and understand the mysterious wisdom of the Godhead. Destroying the works of the forever loser. See their vision for a new era unfolding. The earth realm has seen the entrance of King Jesus for two millennia at levels and ways never seen before, never anticipated by the loser and his fallen ones. The King's person and his ministry of redemption, salvation, and grace has been presented, his kingship declared above all powers, Holy Spirit, the Comforter, the Enabler, the Communicator, has been presented in the earth realm, filling the heirs with the presence and power of His person. Now see new expressions, new discoveries, new dimensions, greater revelation and amplified levels of the Father's heart to those 
in his image and his likeness. Now see, his fathering anointing released into the earth realm in glorious measures. Now see the greatness of Father's heart hovering and covering with his person, saying to a fatherless generation, I want you. I want you. I will be your father. I'll father you. You will not be fatherless. You will not be confused. You will not be lost. I will be your father. I, you will know that my love is set upon you. You will not be orphans. You will not be aimless. I will mentor you. My family will welcome you. My family will embrace you. My family will care for you. My family will raise you. You will not be lost. I will take you in. My fathering nature, my fathering heart will heal you. My hovering presence will realign you. My presence will define you. I will transform you. My heart of love for you will bring clarity to your purpose. You will not be a they. You will not be a whatever. You will be a son. You will be a daughter. You will be an heir, my heir. I will father you. My family will raise you. I will love you to your destiny. I will clear the confusion. I will clear the lies. And I'll bring from you true identity. Holy Spirit said, new levels and new expressions of Father's heart will now be presented in ways not seen before. And much of it is pointed to the coming generation. And his fathering anointing poured into the earth realm will break the yoke of abandonment. It will break it. It's going to break it. It's going to break it. The hearts of the fathers will turn to the children. Brokenness will be healed. And millions will say, I am free. I have identity in father's family. Some kind of supernatural God plan new era of transforming shifts will now be seen. Father's going to reveal his greatness and transform some things. The synergizing triunity of the Godhead in divine oneness is about to answer the challenge of Baal. And earth's harvests are going to be reaped as well as a coming generation will also be about the Father's business. This is an era when God's family is going to grow. Our family is going to grow exponentially. Out of the ugly mess, a transformative time emerges and millions will experience the Father's heart. Greatest days in church history are not in our past. They're in our presence and in our future. Praise God. Did you hear anything familiar in there? Did anything touch your heart? Yeah. The understanding that he talked about for two millennium, we've seen Jesus Christ, the King Jesus presented 
the crucifixion, the resurrection, receiving the salvation, the redemption. We've seen the move of the Holy Spirit, the sweeping of the charismatic era a few decades back. We've seen the Holy Spirit coming into the churches, filling the churches, the gifts flowing through the people. But he said, now we will see the transforming power of the revelation of the Father's heart. The Father's heart. The word that God has given that Pastor John spoke of when he ministered a word from the Lord. The message of love. The Father's heart. A revelation of God. A revelation of God is coming to the church. Coming to the people. And God is bringing us in on that. All of his church. Will we listen? The thing that I've heard uh, quite a bit in his sharing this is the word transform, transformation, which is the very thing that Sister Gail ended with. You will see transformation. God is up to something. I hope we're all paying attention. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you for the time that we've had together. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are leading us, you are showing us and teaching us the ways of our Father's heart, that you are searching his heart, the deep things of his heart, and then you are revealing them to us, just as it says in your word, that even though we can't see with our physical eyes and we can't hear with our physical ears the things that you have desired or the things that you have planned for us, but Holy Spirit is, is digging those things, is learning those things, hearing those things, and bringing those things to us, revealing the heart of you, Father. And we thank you that you have called this group of people here to be a part of that. In whatever capacity you, you have deemed for us, Father God, I thank you that your love leads us and that as we say yes to do what you have called us to do to teach and to train you've called us as a teaching center as a place where people can learn and grow and father that is our vision that's always been our vision and that remains our vision straight from your heart father god help us to know help us to see help us to be able to do what you have called and commissioned us to do and father as we step across the oceans into another land father god i thank you that you have already made a plan you have already made a way and i thank you lord that you lead us and guide us that your hands are upon us over there as well as the 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 family right here Father, that you have great things in store for us. You have great things that, as I said, we don't even know of yet. But we are ob obedient to you. We listen for your voice and we say yes. We say yes to your ways, yes to your heart. Thank you for your love, your great compassion, your great love that without we could not love but i thank you lord i thank you lord and as as we prepare uh to go father god i thank you that your hand is on each life here and that you are blessing because of your word in their hearts that your promises are becoming reality and i thank you father i thank you father that as Pastor Michelle said, you will not lose. You have never lost, and you cannot lose. So if we stay in you, we win. And I thank you, Father, that this people are blessed by you. Your favor goes before them and surrounds them on each side. And I thank you, Lord God, that you have blessed them, and you are continuing to bless them in every way as they become the presence your presence in the earth 
as they become your life, your power, your anointing in the earth. I thank you for them, Father. I cover them with the name and the blood of Jesus and say they are safe, they are free, they are well, they are whole, they are abundantly supplied in every area for every good work and for every charitable donation. I thank you, Father. I thank you for them, and I thank you for your love, your great love. We bless your name. We bless your name, Lord. Everybody said, Amen. Amen.